Hey there, welcome to Riverside. Whether you decide to join us online or in person, I want to welcome you. To get started, if you're new, we ask that you fill out a Connect card. If you're here in person, just reach into the pew in front of you and you can fill it out by hand, or if you prefer, you can do it electronically. You can do it on our app. Our Church Center app is important because it has all of the events on there, ways to sign up for events, ways to connect with us, life groups, all the vital information of Riverside Church. At Riverside, we offer up a three-week challenge, and this is pretty simple. We ask that you come for three Sundays. This gives you time to get to know us and us time to get to know you. Another way that you can be involved here at Riverside in our ministry is by giving through the church. You can give by text, by website, by our church app, and you can also give here in-house in our giving box. Riverside offers several life groups for every age and stage of life. We also offer an amazing youth ministry that meets right here, upstairs, every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Riverside loves kids, and we have a dynamic children's ministry called River Kids. River Kids meets every Sunday at 1030 and is for infants through fifth grade. Your children will have the opportunity to learn about Jesus, sing worship songs, do crafts, and so much more. We have something called Welcome to Riverside. It is our class to get you all the insider knowledge of what's happening at Riverside. And the best part, you get to have pizza. I buy it. It's on me. And you get to sit with me and eat it. How amazing is that? If you have any questions about any of these ministries, we invite you to connect with us in person or to reach out to us on ourchurch.net. So we've talked about staying connected on the church app. But what about social media? Here at Riverside, we have Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And we invite you to follow us on all three. In fact, please go ahead and check in now. And let your friends know you're here at Riverside. Thank you again for being here, and let's see what God can do. Good hey, morning, did... and welcome to Riverside Church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more. Give us more. We need more. More. If you are online joining us today, thank you for doing that. There's always We always have um, some of our uh, regular church folk that can't make it in. Cindy and Grady Wilson, they're on every week. So hi, Cindy and Grady and Connie and uh, who? Who? <laughs> There's other people. Okay. You're getting cat calls in the audience if you're online. So anyways, so today... I'm just going to say, whew. in our rhythm of life, we have been used to uh, big children's events during the summer, and once Nancy and I sort of get through that big children's event, it's like, okay, we got some downtime, we can relax a little bit and, uh, and take some time to chill out for the rest of the summer. Well, we had our event, this is the first time we tried this event here at Riverside, and uh, we had it. We just finished it. It was a great time. We're going to show you some video of it next week when we can give you a better quality than just throwing something together in a couple of hours. But uh, we had our event, and, and now we're chilling out. And, of course, now we sort of run into the cycle of lots of vacation, lots of people away. So, anyways, I hope that you're going to enjoy the summer with us, and we're going to enjoy the summer with you. I've got a couple things I want to tell you about uh, first of all, some long-range plans coming up, just so that you know. In September, at the end of September, we're going to be having a Women's Day here at the church, and the focus is going to be faith, hope, and love. We're putting all of this together right now with some speakers uh, in the church, outside of the church, and uh, a lot of testimonies. And so I think it's September 24th, last Saturday in September, we want you to put that aside, and uh, you're going to be blessed by this. In October, you've been seeing this announcement. We would like to take a group up to see David at the Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster. I've personally never been there, but I've only heard rave reviews about it. You might say, why is this happening on a Monday? Because that is a holiday. That Monday is a holiday. 
And so here's what our goal is, is that we'd have enough people in the church that we could actually rent a bus and have somebody take us up there. It's going to be an added expense, but I think it would be worth it not having to buy the gas and drive ourselves. So if you want to buy a ticket, we're doing tickets till the end of July. Uh, we want you to buy a ticket, do it online, go through our church center app and get that done. In October, uh, I'm not even going to give you the dates on these things, but they're just coming up. But we are going to have an all-church picnic in October out at Arbor Havens Farms. Uh, that is going to be a great time for us just to get together and celebrate. And also, oh, yeah, if you're an old person, <laughs> on Tuesday, we have something called Young at Heart, Really Old at Body, and it meets at 11.30 back in our gym area, and it's a carry-in, bring some food in with you. Uh, Art always gives a devotion. June brings a game. Um, maybe if you're lucky, I'll bring a guitar, and I'll sing you a song. I'm amazing. I, I admit it. But... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, when they throw things at you, isn't that a sign of them liking you? Because people throw things, shrimp and food. But uh, anyways, they meet from 1130 to about 1230. Love to have you if you're, they say 50 and above, but 50-year-olds are working. I don't know what, why they invite 50-year-olds, but if you're above 50 and above, you can come and hang out and, uh, and be a part of that. So if you're part of the children's ministry, you'll notice that there's something upcoming with that as well. But uh, th those are things that were happening, and uh, I, wanna, I want you to pray and respond to our worship team today. I, I mentioned this in the first service, but they have problems. <laughs> you can tell, so, can't so you? so encouraging. Yeah, no. <laughs> Jennifer's family's all sick, and she's just sort of powering through things today, and and so lift her up in prayer, and Vincent and Priscilla, they've been through some things lately. Our, our whole worship team has sort of been, uh, maybe you didn't know, but our drummer, uh, his, his son took his own life here uh, about a month ago. And so, yeah, there's been a lot of, of spiritual attack upon our worship team's lives. And, and so lift them up in prayer. And and you know, when we come together, we don't come together to listen to them. We come to bless the Lord. Now, they bless us, but we bless the Lord because, as Jennifer said earlier this morning, He is our audience today. Uh, you're not the audience. He's the audience. And so I, I want to tell you just from my standpoint and from their st standpoint, when you are encouraged and when you clap or lift a hand or say amen, uh, it is so encouraging uh, for the body of Christ. And we are here to edify one another. And as I said in the early service, every time you say hallelujah during the sermon, I, like, I, sh I take a minute off the sermon. It's, <laughs> so. It's only while I'm preaching. <laughs> Let's stand together. I want to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. And some of us are tired in body because we've had a big week here hanging out with the kids. And others are, are just sort of tired in spirit because they have wrestled through some things to be here. And Father, that's not just those up front, but that's all of us. Every time we come to this house, we are declaring to the enemy that he is defeated. We are, we are lifting our hands and saying God is glorified and he's on the throne. And Father, we want to praise you right now. No matter how we feel, we want to praise you because you're true. Your word is true. You are faithful. You are, you are powerful. You are loving. You are forgiving. You are good. And Lord, no matter what we feel at this moment, no matter what we're going through at this moment, we have an opportunity right now through our praise and worship to once again tell the enemy and to tell you what we stand for and what we believe. And the enemy will flee. But you said you will fill the house when your people praise. So fill this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning.
Morning Riverside. Let's worship together. because of it, aren't we? God is so good. So I've heard it said that um, that many churches, many churches, that when the congregation comes to worship, this is the order that it goes in. We have the performers are on stage. We have the prompter, who is God. And then we have the audience, who is the congregation. But that's not what it's supposed to be like, right? That's not what it's like here at Riverside. Here at Riverside, whoever's on stage is the prompter. You are the performers for our almighty God. And God is our audience of one. Everything that we do here in this place while we are here is an offering to God. Whether it is prayer, encouragement, giving, the word being preached on the stage, um, actually singing, worship, the music, all of these, all of these work together in this 
beautiful gift that we give to our God who gave everything for us. So I want you to take the time to just quiet your mind now while you're here. And let's put it back in perspective.
are holy. And we offer it all to you, God. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your faithfulness. God, continue to move in this place. Be near to us. Pull us close to you, God. Speak to us today so that we can leave here better disciples for you. We praise you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's see what God can do this morning. We're talking about termites, termites, uh, sneaky little, sneaky little bugs that, uh, I don't know, it's so funny, but I'm doing, so, what am I doing up here? Yeah. Oh, I got it. I think I got it, Glenn. Good? Good to go? All right. Anyways, uh, termites are sneaky little bugs, you know, and, and you don't even know you have them until the damage is done on your house. At our last house, uh, one day, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, I don't know what I was doing back there. I noticed something was going on with part of the corner of our floor in our, in our family room, and man, it was squishy. And I had to redo a bunch of floor joists and stuff because they had been damaged and you never know what's happening until it happens. And so we're talking about termites in the walls of the church. In other ways, in other words, these pesky little creatures that may be eating away at our faith and we don't even know it's happening until it's way late and the damage is done. We started this series last week, and since many are gone on 4th of, 4th of July weekend, I, I want to reiterate something we talked about last week. We talked about last week that one of the termites that can get in the hearts of Christians and in the heart of the church is that we begin to relax the commandments of God. Right in Matthew 5, 19, Jesus talked about this. He says, if you relax the commandments of God, you will be least in the kingdom of heaven. But if you will do them, you'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. And one of the termites that we are constantly battling as followers of Jesus is telling ourselves, I know Jesus said to do this, or I know God commanded this, but I don't think I have to do it. It's, we're telling ourselves stuff like this. What, is God going to send me to hell if I don't forgive them? I mean, is that going to happen? Is God going to send me to hell just because I have sex outside of marriage? Is God going to send me to hell if, if I'm not a giver in my life? And what Jesus would answer you is, you know, everything that God has spoken and everything that I have spoken is for your best, and we only speak the best, and we only speak what's good for you. And so if you're going to look at what we have spoken, and you're going to put it aside and say, well, I've got a better idea of something I should do, then what, what Jesus would say is something like this. As soon as you relax my commands and say, I don't have to do them, then the living and active Word of God is no longer going to be working inside of your life and inside of your situation you're going to get to have your word working on you, not my word. So, hey, if you want to relax my commands, you're on your own. Today we want to look at a second termite that is potentially, and we do battle this, every one of us, but potentially these are in our hearts and in our church, and, and we're going to find this in an Old Testament story, but we're going to talk about the problem of idols inside of our lives. Idols are things that want to take the place of God inside of your heart, and an idol wants you to treat it like a God. Idols are good things that become God things. 
Idols are things that absorb your heart and take you away from God. Idols are things that we begin to love more than we love God. And, and you might say, well, why would we give ourselves to anything but Jesus? Why would we give ourselves to an idol? Well, it's because of this. You were created for your soul to be filled. And if your soul is not going to be filled with Jesus, you will find another lover to fill your soul with. And idols are always just sitting there going, come on, I can give you what you really want. And idols then become a substitute for God. So I want to take you to an Old Testament book, the Old Testament book of Judges. If you have your Bible, Judges chapter 6 is where we're going to go. And this book is relevant for us today because Judges speaks to a time, a dark time in the history of Israel where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. That's the theme verse of Judges. It's repeated several times. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So they were living in a time where it's like, I don't care what God said. I'm just going to do what I want to do. I don't care if God said not to do that. I'm going to do it anyways. I, you know, I have my own truth, and they pursued their own truth. And, and I have my own agenda, and they pursued their own agenda, much like the world we live in today. And when they did it, when they pursued everything but God and their idols, they got into a lot of trouble. So if you ever read or read the book of Judges, you're going to see a cycle that keeps taking place in the book of Judges. It starts with a time where all the people are devoted to God. It's like, God, you're our number one, and we love you, God. And then they start falling away from God. They start getting their idols or other things inside of their life, doing what they want to do, whatever's in their heart. They follow their heart. And then things start going south. And they get to the bottom of the cycle. And now they're sort of reaping the consequences of doing everything they wanted. And disaster takes, overtakes them. And now at the bottom of the cycle, it's like, what? And they begin to cry out to God, Lord, save us. We're in trouble. The other nations are taking us over. And, and then God begins to move, and the cycle begins to move the other way. God moves, God sends a deliverer, and the people are like, okay, God, we're sorry. And then it goes back to the top, where they're like, okay, we're devoted to you again, God. And then it, it all happens again. And then it happens again, and it happens again. It's all through the book of Judges. So when you get to Judges chapter 6, you are at the bottom of the cycle. It is a disaster what is happening. These people have turned away from God. They're worshiping their own idols. They're doing whatever's right in their own eyes, you know, following their heart. And when they do that, their neighboring nation, a place called Midian, rises up and they come in to Israel's territory. And I just need to tell you, it's really, really bad for them. For seven years in a row, we read in Judges 6 that the Midianites would swarm in, set up their tents during the seasons when the crops were being harvested, and, and they would just take everything. They were aggressive, nasty, armed, and very hostile people. And so they would just come in, they would take not only the crops, but the sheep and the ox and the donkeys, just everything they could get their hands on. And then they'd pack up and they'd leave, go back to their, their own land. And the Israelites, they're so scared when this happens that they have run into the hills where they have dug little caves out for themselves and they're just scrounging for whatever they can salvage. The Bible says that the Midianites laid waste to the land. But one day a prophet, now, now they're crying out to God, you know, God save us, and a prophet shows up. And a prophet tells them, hey, you know this isn't the way it's supposed to be, right? He says, you, do got, you guys know that you are the chosen people, right? And that there was a time when God saved you out of slavery, and here you are back in slavery to a different nation and you guys know that this is of your own making, right? Like, you've done this to yourself. And then the people begin to cry out. 
God save us, and God hears their prayers. But God moves in a very unconventional way. He sends, God sends a messenger, an angel, to find a man, a man who is not exactly brimming with self-confidence. The man's name is Gideon. And unfortunately, Gideon belongs to the smallest tribe in all the nation of Israel. And unfortunately, Gideon is in the smallest family of the smallest tribe in Israel. And you might say, well, why is that important in the story? Because of this. If God wanted to make a move, he should have gone to the biggest tribe that had the most fighting men, and he would have gone to the biggest family of that tribe because when that tribe would have said, men come and let's do battle against the Midianites, there would have been a swarm of people to come and, and fight. But instead, God goes to the smallest tribe and the smallest family, and he's going to work that way. It's just as we have said a couple of weeks ago, God, call, God equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped, and he's going to equip Gideon for this fight. Well, the angel finds Gideon, and where does he find him? In a hole in the ground. And Gideon has scavenged some wheat, and he's in this hole, and he's refining the wheat in this hole. He's doing it because nobody can see him doing it. He's doing it because he's scared. He's nervous. He's stressed out. He's hungry. He's under the thumb of the Midianite oppressor like everybody else is. And then the angel speaks to Gideon when he finds him. And this is where we pick up the story in Judges 6, 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. I mean, this is almost laughable. Mighty man, valor, Hiding in a hole, there's no indication of any courage in this man's life, any bravery. He's like everybody else. And Gideon speaks back to the angel, and he tells him what's on his mind. Verse 13, And Gideon said to him, to the angel, Please, my Lord, if the Lord, if Yahweh, if the great God of Israel is with us, Why then has all of this happened to us? And where are the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now, Yahweh, the great God of Israel, the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon is complaining. He's complaining because he had heard about God, he'd heard about God's power, but now he's saying, where are you, God? Where is this great God? Why is God doing this to us? God has forsaken us. Why is this happening? Come on, God, you have failed us. But what's funny to me is that Gideon takes absolutely no responsibility for the condition that his people are in. And so I want to take a pause just in the the story for a moment to recount to you one of the principles of, of life and of the Bible that we ought not forget. And here it is. Your direction determines your destination in life. Gideon had arrived at a destination. And his destination was arrived at because he was traveling a direction, the direction of I'm going to do whatever is right in my own eyes, so is my family. We're going to worship these idols, so on and so forth. And when they chose that, they got on a road, and now they're in their destination. And it's a pitiful place to be. But what's Gideon doing? Lord, it's your fault. It's not ours. But this is a principle that you will never outlive in life. Your direction determines your destination. So in a couple of weeks, I'm very fortunate that We have rented a little place in South Carolina, and I'm going to gather with my family and my grandkids, and we've been talking about the food we're going to eat when we get there. And I went up to Battlefield Country Store this week, and I bought a bunch of candy, not for the grandkids, but for me, of course. (laughs) 
And, you know, we're getting our clothes together. I bought a couple pairs of shorts. And we're talking about, you know, I've been online, like, is there some lake toys we need to get? And we've rented a boat. And, you know, we're praying about a good, having a good time. But, but if I get on I-95 on the 23rd of July and I start going north, I don't care how many prayers I've prayed. I don't care what my intentions are. It doesn't matter what I've packed in my suitcases. I will never arrive at my destination because the path I'm on is going to determine where I end up. Your direction is always going to determine your destination. Now, you know, the weird thing is we know about this when it comes to driving in a car, but sometimes we exempt ourselves in other areas of life. Like we say stuff like this. You know, I really want my kids to grow up to be strong in Jesus. So I'll tell you what my plan is. I'm going to keep them out of church two out of every four weeks. Or I really want to be healthy in body, so supersize it. <laughs> I want to save enough so I can retire. Charge it. All of us are on a path. Financial path, family path, marriage path. Health path, we're on a spiritual path. And it's your direction that determines your destination. It doesn't matter how much you've prayed about it or your intentions or how much you read the Bible about it. It is the path that will determine where you end up. There was a guy named Daniel Berrigan who was asked one time, is faith in your head or is faith in your heart? And I hope this doesn't offend you, but he said this, neither, it's where your butt's at. That's where your faith is. It's where you're sitting right now in your life. And this path can either lead you to something joyous and satisfactory, or it can lead you to a counselor's office. Because believe me, I've had plenty of people come to my, into my office and say, how did this happen? How did we get here? How did my marriage come to this place? And I always have to just say, well, what did you think was going to happen when you started hanging out with your boys every night and drinking with them? What did you think was going to happen when you started using pornography? What did you think was going to happen when you spent your paycheck on gambling? What did you think was going to happen when you worked 40 hours of overtime a week? What did you think was going to happen when you hung around those people? I mean, did you think you were going to end up in a good place? So for Gideon, the question is, Gideon, what did you think was going to happen? When you decided to do whatever was in your heart and you're going to worship these idols, did you think you were going to really end up in a good place? So Gideon's blaming God. The angel just ignores Gideon's complaint, and the angel says this in verse 14. And the Lord turned to him, to Gideon, and he said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you and he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. What is the might of Gideon? I will be with you. Now, I'm going to tell you the end of the story because there's a part of the story we're going to get to. But if you've been in church any length of time, you know the end of the story already. So Gideon puts the call out. Guys, we've got to beat back the Midianites. God has empowered me to lead this thing. 32,000 men show up. God says, too many men because if you guys win this, you'll think you won it. You won't think that I won it for you. So get rid of some of these guys. He pairs it down to 10,000. God says, too many men because you're going to think you won the war. He pairs it down again. 300 men are left. And then one fateful night, these 300 men go up on the mountain surrounding the valley where the Midianites are camped. They all have a torch. They all have a, a, a horn. And at the sound of the trumpet, you know, they all, well, they all sound the trumpet. They all break open their, their, uh, their jar and this torch lights on fire. And the Midianites look up on the hills and they don't see 300 men. They see 300,000 men up there. And they go panicking. They fight each other. They run away. Israel wins the battle and they stomp out the Midianite army. It's a great end of the story. But there's a little part of the story that I missed. And this is the part of the story about the termites the idols that get into our life. 
Before God sent Gideon to fight the battle, he gave Gideon an assignment. And you'll find it in verse 25 of Judges 6. That night the Lord said to Gideon, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Little context here. These would have been two poles, tree, logs, stumps, whatever you want to call them, that would have been carved into some image of an idol, one called Baal, one called Asherah. They would have been overlaid with some kind of precious metal or jewels or something like this, set up in the middle of their town, and they would have been worshipped there. So God is telling them, here's what I want you to do. You're going to go into your father's town. You're going to pull these suckers down. And then he says this. When you do it, build an, back to verse 26 there, build an altar to the Lord, your God, on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. So in the very place where these idols were, I want you to build an altar. Then take the second bull, and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah or the very wood of the idol. Put that wood and make it on the altar and then burn up that wood and sacrifice the bull. Verse 27, So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it. By night. So the very first thing that God asks Gideon to do before he sends them out in the battle, before he he can win this battle, is he says, if you want your town to be blessed, if you want your nation to be blessed, if you want to be able to defeat the enemy that is torturing you right now, then I want you to go in the middle of your town and I want you to come against these idols that that have been erected there. I want you to pull those things down and then build an altar to me and I want you to make a sacrifice to me. And what God was telling Gideon was this, I want you to go and surrender the place of your sinning and, and the object of your sin to me. And I want you to tear apart the idol that is rivaling me and your family. And I want you to remove the lies that these idols are telling you and that you're clinging to and that you've been attached to. Now, this is a rather bold move, and that's why he does it in the middle of the night, because he doesn't know what's going to happen. In fact, later on, they do rise up, and they want to kill Gideon for doing this. But his father says, hey, if Baal's a real God, let him take care of it. And then Gideon's safe because Baal's not a real God. Now, when you read the Bible from a 21st century sophistication, we sort of snicker at this stuff like, ah, you know, a couple of poles in the middle of town, a couple of idols. You know, everybody knows they're fake, right? They're just some stumps of trees carved to look like something. There's nothing behind that because we're so smart in this, in this culture of ours, right? Anybody could figure out that these things had no power. But you're wrong. And I'm wrong about that. Baal was a god of power. And so these people were depending on Baal to protect them. And Asherah was the god of fertility. And so they sacrificed to this god so they could get sun and rain and their crops would grow. And these idols had usurped the role of God. They should have been looking to God for that. But these idols usurped their role. And they believed sincerely, that they needed these idols. And these idols were God's rivals. But I've got to tell you something. Behind those idols, there was demon power. There's demon power behind these things. Have you ever watched a Lifetime movie? I have. (laughs) Idols are like the bad boyfriends in a Lifetime movie. 
you know, she meets the guy. He's too good to be true. He's good looking. He opens the door. He's so nice. And they fall in love. And he moves in. And then all the weirdness happens. <laughs> he gets testy. And then he gets abusive. And he gets controlling. And the next thing you know, the wife is afraid and she's become a slave to this guy. And every day she's just trying to do whatever it takes to keep him happy. Well, that is an Old Testament idol. And those people, they were scared of those idols. There was no love relationship. They were not in love with Baal. All they wanted to do was whatever they had to do so they wouldn't get angry. Because an angry God, an angry idol, would cause you to lose your crops or lose a baby or lose a war. And all they wanted to do was try to keep these idols happy. Because if the idols, these gods, were unhappy, it's going to take a sacrifice to get them happy again. And you might have to give them some food. Or you might have to give them an animal. You might even have to give them a child. You don't want to mess with these idols. But they became slaves to them. So this is real stuff. I want to talk to you about our idols. Because idols are still around and we are still slaves to them. And an idol is anything that you give yourself to or you attach yourself to because you hope that life will find meaning and comfort in that thing. An idol is any good thing that you elevate to a God thing. Do you remember Imelda Marcos? She was the first lady of the Philippines. I think this was back in the 80s when this happened. But her husband was toppled out of power. And when they came into the palace that they lived in, the presidential palace, they found thousands, acres of shoes. That's what her idol was. She found comfort in shoes. She turned to shoes for comfort. And I know you're thinking, that's weird. But you guys, we do the same thing. We find a God substitute, something we can turn to for comfort. And these idols that we turn to, they always promise what they can't deliver. And that idol begins to rival or replace the one true God in our lives. And that idol becomes an object of our affection. It becomes something, it becomes something that I serve. And then I begin to give myself over to that thing. And that thing, that idol, begins to direct my decisions and dominate my thinking. I want to tell you the truth. Idol worship is one of the biggest challenges that go on in our hearts every single day of our life. And idol worship itself is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. And idol worship, idols are constantly trying to vie for the throne of your heart. They want to sit in the command center. Idols want to play the dominant, have the dominant position in your life. And idols are always saying the same thing. Bow to me. Bow to me and I will give you the abundant life. An idol is anything that you're looking at and you're saying deep down in your heart, if I get that, I'll finally have life. If I get that, my life will finally have meaning. If I could just have that, I will finally feel like I have value. If I can just get there, I will finally feel significant and secure. If I just can have that, I will finally have the good life. Why do we turn to idols? It's because we are created to want our soul filled. And if our soul is not filled with Jesus, we'll just find it somewhere else. We are always in search of new lovers in our life. And when we start to cling to things that we think is going to make everything okay, if we can just get that thing. If, if my life could just go a certain way and, 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 and end up in a good place, and that thing promises me that, that it will give it to me, then we will attach ourselves to it. 
in my lifetime, one of the things I've been very concerned about is the idol of sports in our nation. I have seen many parents whose children had some kind of an athletic talent turn that talent into an idol. Because that idol says stuff like this, I'll get you a college scholarship. Your guy can't do that. But I'll do it. And, and I'll get you some value. People will look up to you. Now, your God can't do that, but my, your, your, your talent will do that. I'll get you the good life. In fact, I'm, I'll, I'll make you millions. Now, your God ain't going to do that for you, but I'll, I'll make you millions. And then the parents, they sort of buy into this too because they're thinking, if he's famous, we're going to be a little bit famous too. Because actually, after all, we raise this kid. But what we never realize is that the idol wants to play that dominant place in our heart. And the price to get there is usually the influence and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because the idol always dethrones God. The idol always says, you don't need God's word. You don't need God's people. You don't need God's glory. You don't need God's truth. You don't even need God's church. I can give you all of that. And so some people take a good thing, which is sports, and they make a God thing out of it. And then 10 years later, they have a mediocre athlete who never really made it, who has no relationship with Jesus Christ whatsoever. And all the self-esteem and the riches and everything else that that idol promised is blowing in the wind. But it's not just sports. We can do it with beauty. If I could just look like that, we could do it with influence. If I could just be more important, we do it with money. If I could just have a little bit more, we do it with celebrity. If everybody would just love me, we do it with family. Oh, I, we, can't, we can't do this because, you know, I, I've known people, it's like they told me they had a calling of God in their life. Well, I. I can't go away to school because my mom and dad live here and I can't leave my family. Well, that's just become your idol. We do it with reputation. We do it with our image management. We do it with retirement. This is my time. I'm retired. I put my time in. It's all about me now. That's an idol. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. I'm going to give you four common idols that enslave us. And you could find yourself in this. I certainly know where I rank in this. But here they are, the idol of approval. Now, the idol of approval is manifested in your heart with self-pity, hurt feelings, feelings of inadequacy, and envy. If you have those, you probably have an idol of approval. The idol of comfort. It's manifested because you can't say no to anything. You can't say no to pleasure, food, sex, pornography. Or third, the idol of power. It's manifested because maybe you're domineering, you're harsh, or you have abusive behavior. Or the fourth one is the idol of control. And this is seen because we constantly worry. We're losing our temper. We're manipulating other people. But we battle against these things constantly. And our culture produces a new idol like every five minutes. If you could just get this, then you'll have made it. In the New Testament, it talks a lot about idols, but it also talks a lot about another word, desires. Anything that makes us feel good or look good or think we are good. That's the, and we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. And God's church, by the way, we're not immune to our own set of idols. Believe me, I have felt the pressure that we have to be, you know, the mega church, the cool church, the hipster church, the skinny jeans church, you know, the black rim glasses with a couple of tattoos and laser lights and smoke machines. And, you know, because the idol in church world where I live is success. And that's what it looks like. I've seen people enslaved to money, career, politics, their political positions, recreation, physical appearance, even phones. And you know it's an idol when somebody touches it or confronts you about it or challenges you about it and you don't like it. 
I'll tell you what, you take a phone away from somebody and you'll see an idol start World War III. So, <laughs> so I want to wrap this up because we're late and you didn't say amen enough times. So <laughs> actually the sermon was 50 minutes. I'm down to like 30 now. But anyway, so what happens with Gideon? You know, Gideon goes into his town, he pulls down those idols, he takes the wood of the idols right on the spot where the idol was. He sacrifices to his God. He declares, my God is stronger, and we worship God in this town now. And, and the men of the town, by the way, they're angry about it. They want to kill him, but, but uh, Gideon's father steps in and doesn't let that happen. But, but the first thing that Gideon had to take care of was that termite of idolatry that was stealing the glory of God, stealing the word of God, stealing who God was, and, and he had to pull it down and show everybody this doesn't rule. In our own lives, in our own lives, we may have to do a little idol pulling. We may have to go in and we may have to, you know, pull those idols down and say, you're not calling the shots anymore. You're not ruling my heart anymore. You have turned into a God thing, so I am putting you back into a good thing, and I'm putting you back in your place. Jesus Christ is my Lord, and whatever he wants to provide, he will provide, but I am not looking to you to provide these things for me anymore. We need possibly to pull some idols down today. And things that maybe we're attached to a little too deeply, we need to detach from and declare that Jesus is the one in our life that is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says this, Therefore, my beloved, flee from adultery. Don't play around with adultery. Don't look at it. Don't hang around. Where you see it, run as fast as you can and pull that thing down and put Jesus back into its place. Let's stand. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus right now that you will have moved upon us and maybe you have revealed to us a place in our own heart where we have erected something. We're expecting that thing to give us what only you can give us. Today, Father, let us put you back into the center. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to pray this morning about maybe an idol or something else that's going on, I invite you to pray. We would love to pray with you. Now Gideon, you know, he didn't want to do it in front of everybody, so he did it in the middle of the night. I will be unavailable in the middle of the night to pray about that. But I am available now if, I, if you would like me to pray. Come and let's pray together. Love.
No power of hell, no scheme of hell. 